Hello, I'm Rick Harnish, Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We've got an exciting presentation uh, coming about uh, a, a new type of radios for communi railroad communications. Um, but first, a little bit about us for those who are joining us new. So we're an educational nonprofit. We are supported by our members, people like you who want to be able to ride uh, trains in the United States on a regular basis or want the uh, community benefits that happen because trains are there and people are riding trains um, in large numbers. We strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of what high-speed rail is, um, why we should build it here in the States and what steps can be taken uh, to get it built as quickly as possible. Um, we believe in a network approach where various types of tracks and various types of trains connect together to serve entire regions, um, not just large city pairs. Um, and uh, trains and railroads are incredibly versatile. You can put them together in different ways like you can a Lego set. Uh, but to simplify it, we've uh, uh, simplified it down to shared use lines, which will probably be most of the mileage where passenger trains are, are operating frequently with heavy freight trains. It can work in this country. There are places where it does work. It doesn't work in most places because we just simply haven't invested in the right track. Our regional lines are where typically a government entity would um, put the infrastructure into public ownership and focus it on fast, frequent passenger trains. Maybe there's some freight trains on there, maybe not. Uh, the Northeast Corridor linking Washington, New York, and Boston is uh, the most robust regional line in the country. Um, and we're excited about uh, the development of regional rail between San Francisco and San Jose that's under construction and also a big project in Toronto. And then high speed lines are what really bring the juice to the party where you're building new infrastructure that, so that you can go 200 miles an hour plus. Um, unfortunately, we've fallen way behind the rest of the world on this, but uh, with a couple of key segments in the right places in this decade, we can really demonstrate this, that this will work. And if we can get cities, uh, states working on planning the next phase, um, it'll really be transformative. Um, typically in the past, uh, high-speed rail has been sold as a city to city thing, city pairs in the 100 to 500 mile range, for example. Certainly they do very well in that category uh, but we need to think much bigger. We need to be thinking in networks, not just in city pairs. Um, and we use this little diagram to explain why long-term planning needs to be. If you just look at city pairs, you don't really have much opportunity to take the train. But if you look at all of the travel that happens on the network, suddenly there's a lot more opportunity to take the train and perhaps investing in a new high-speed line here in the middle um, is the best way to really drive volume on the outer edges um, with improvements to the existing railroads on those in the first phase. But to do this, we need regional plans, uh, network plans, and the Federal Railroad Administration has started that process, but we need to amp that up. So today we're here to talk about a specific um, part of that network, which is the communications between uh, the people uh, running the trains and the people dispatching the trains in order to um, make sure that the right trains are in the right places at the right times um, and not in the wrong places at the wrong times. Um, and so we have Keith Ammons, um, who is the VP of Market Development at Power Trunk. Uh, to talk about a specific kind of radio and the advantages it has uh, for communications and railroads um, and what these radios could do for the U.S. So thank you very much, Keith, for being with us and uh, go ahead and take it away. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Rick, for that introduction. One second there. Okay. Is that visible to everyone? It's not yet. No. Oh, okay. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So, okay. So, Rick, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with here uh, with everyone here today to uh, to speak to you about this topic, and I appreciate the effort that everyone has made to to tune in with us today. Um, but yes, I'll be speaking today about the case for using Tetra technology for railway communication and uh, signaling applications. Uh, a bit about our company, about Power Trunk. We actually, we are the North American subsidiary of a Spanish company known as Teltronic uh, with over 40 years of experience in design and manufacture of uh, professionally used radio communication systems, uh, more of a mission critical, business critical nature. We have hundreds of network references all, all over the world. Uh, and as far as uh, Power Trunk is concerned, we are uh, present here in North America for the, about the past 12 years or so, uh, headquartered out of Jersey City, New Jersey, and we just recently also opened a uh, Canadian office in, in Montreal. Um, a bit about what uh, I'll be mentioning in, in this presentation, I'll be talking about the use of uh, Tetra Communications technology uh, for railway communications and signaling talk a bit about the network infrastructure and the onboard equipment that we are able to offer. And, and then some of the technical details about the different uh, data services, communication interfaces um, that can be uh, taken advantage of from Tetra for, for the rail, railroad uh, sec sector. And then talk about the viability of Tetra even for uh, rail signaling, even at uh, high speed environments. Um, we do have a few references that I can briefly go over as well, and I'll talk to you about also about how to, to do the uh, how to perform the integration process uh, to integrate Tetra technology into uh, a railway signaling application. So there's a lot to go over today, um, and even so, we're probably just going to just scratch the surface. So let's uh, jump right in. Um, when we're talking about uh, railway signaling. And, and communication requirements, uh, the, uh, the data that is transmitted or being carried can be really divided into three broad categories. Uh, we have basic voice and critical data needs, which would be your standard voice com communication standard basic data or day-to-day -day operations of your, of your network. Uh, then you have uh, vital data needs, which does include the, uh, the signaling system. And then non-mission critical data needs, which are uh, nice to have, such as uh, access to a public address system, uh, onboard advertising, onboard video, onboard Wi-Fi, and so on. So it's it's nice to have those uh, onboard your your railway vehicles, but it's not really mission critical uh, data. So uh, today's presentation, we're going to be concentrating really on this middle part here on vital data needs as applicable to railway signaling applications. And then some of the other um, requirements associated with rail signaling, uh, of course, compliance with uh, railway regulations and standards, um, provision of continuous data transmission, completely uninterruptible 100% uh, of the time, uh, a data only terminal for the signaling part of the operation, and then voice is managed uh, separately from the from the data. One of the advantages of Tetra, however, is that we're able to transmit voice and data over the same network. So that can be run as two parallel virtual private networks, but over a single network infrastructure. So that that provides a, um, a cost advantage in rolling out the system with Tetra as opposed to uh, other types of technologies that are out there. And then, of course, most importantly, uh, for uh, as a signaling requirement, you have to ensure the safety of the persons and the goods that are being that are being transported. Uh, there are also different requirements depending on the environment that you're operating with, be it uh, rail freight, passenger lines, or more uh, urban mass transit. Uh, for rail freight, we're talking long distances but low traffic density. Uh, 
uh, for passenger lines. It's uh, urban and suburban environments, medium traffic uh, density, but higher uh, vehicle speeds than at uh, standard uh, rail freight. And then for uh, uh, mass transit, mass urban transit, we're talking about uh, short distance, high volume, you know, things like underground subways and tramways, for, uh, for example, both uh, indoors, outdoors, and underground areas. Uh, fortunately, as far as Tetra is uh, concerned, uh, we are able to support all three of these uh, traffic models with this technology, uh, with a narrow band uh, radio solution. Uh, the, the amount of data that can be transported uh, transmitted over a Tetra system uh, is of such volume that it can be it can be easily handed handled by the Tetra system without without necessarily requiring a broadband solution. And then some of the current rail signaling uh, applications or protocols that are out there: um, PTC positive train control which is kind of a, a set of recommendations being developed here in the US for, for control, uh, for rail signaling control systems in the US, pr primarily for main lines, freight lines, based on GPS or geographic uh, positioning data and communication-based control systems. Uh, in Europe, uh, it, it, we see there the European train control system, ETCS, this is used uh, throughout the, the European continent, uh, mainly for high speed and conventional lines, uh, as defined as part of the uh, ERTMS system, the European Rail Train Management System. And the main objective of, uh, of the ETCS and the ERTMS, it's mainly for uh, interoperability of cross-border traffic within Europe. And then uh, CPTC, communication-based train control, uh, there's a variety of, of applications and companies and uh, equipment out there using different types of protocols, mainly used for subways or tramways for mass transit systems. Not standard. There's no guaranteed uh, interoperability from one manufacturer to another. Um, so it's more of a case, case by case basis for each city, for each network, for each system that you may be uh, concerned with. Uh, a little bit about Tetra. What is it exactly? Well, Tetra is a, a digital uh, mobile radio uh, technology standard. It was initially developed as a mission critical public safety standard for use by the European uh, government and public safety uh, agencies. Um, however, this was uh, very quickly picked up by other sectors around the world as well, including uh, public transport, public utilities, and even some general industry customers as well. And not only in Europe, but throughout the Middle East, Asia Pacific regions, uh, Africa, uh, South America. And then just recently, just only recently though, however, it has started to come into the North American market. Uh, Tetra is an open standard, fully open. So there are half a dozen or, or more manufacturers uh, producing products according to the standard. Uh, so the interoperability and the compatibility of the equipment is, is guaranteed and is verified through an independent test house, um, giving the customer then more choice uh, about the bits and pieces that they want to select and from which supplier to put together a, a, a completely interoperable Tetra network. Tetra is particularly well known for its outstanding speech quality. Um, it supports half duplex and full duplex communication uh, private calls, group calls, broadcast calls, even for emergency situations with uh, various emergency priorities that can be designated as well. Uh, simultaneous voice and data over a single network, as I've already mentioned, and we support uh, short, uh, short, short data transmission, such as status messaging and, and text messaging and GPS information, but also uh, IP packet data and circuit data modes as well, which I will get into a little bit more detail here. And when looking at Tetra as compared to other types of uh, digital land mobile radio technologies and standards that are out there, Tetra does in fact offer the, the, uh, the highest data uh, rate compared to their technologies. So I'm, I'll, I will provide more details, details on that as well. Okay, about the uh, Tetra network itself and the onboard equipment. Uh, well, PowerTrunk, we provide complete 
end-to-end -end solutions, uh, including on a turnkey basis. We produce the network infrastructure, we produce the onboard equipment, the uh, command and control room equipment and applications. Um, we have our own uh, research and development, production and project management uh, divisions within our company. So we are able to provide uh, full service, uh, full turnkey uh, solutions for, uh, for railway applications. Um, compliant with the, the pertinent uh, railway standards. And then the, uh, the data traffic and the quality of service parameter requirements, then we discuss those with the customer, with the rail signaling uh, application manufacturer uh, to, to integrate um, the Tetra network, radio network into the, the signaling application. This is just a general diagram here depicting uh, the wayside equipment, the Tetra radio network, and the onboard equipment, how it all ties together. And some other bullet points here about Tetra. It's 100% uh, uh, Ethernet IP architecture internally, simultaneous voice and data I mentioned, uh, easily scalable. So as your uh, network requirements uh, grow, be it uh, as far as capacity or as for geographic area that needs to be covered, uh, the, the network can be uh, expanded and rolled out uh, accordingly, according to the customer's needs. A distributed intelligence along the different parts of the switching network within the network, uh, full Tetra functionality, fault tolerant design, full redundancy management, um, and uh, other software and protocols and APIs uh, to permit uh, efficient management of the resources, such as for dedicated radio channels for the trains. Two basic uh, onboard equipment models we have here. They're very similar. The form factor varies a little bit slightly, but the functionality is basically the same. Here we have the, uh, uh, the RTPS, uh, 10 watt RF output power, uh, IP and serial uh, interfaces for connecting to uh, external systems for connection to the uh, onboard computer uh, on, on the trains. Um, RS-232, 422, and Ethernet interfaces and uh, data modem like functions. And of course, it's uh, ruggedized equipment specifically designed and certified for railway use. And, and this model uh, also includes uh, a Wi-Fi connectivity uh, option in addition to the Tetra radio bands. And then the second model, again, very similar to this. Uh, form factor is a little bit different, but the basic operations is the same. Um, but this one, the second one here also includes uh, an LTE option, a broadband option, uh, which is coming more and more into demand uh, with the current technology. Data services and communication interfaces uh, in, in Tetra. Um, again, this, this diagram basically is similar to the one I just previously showed, but here you see a bit more about um, the data services, uh, PDP, packet data service, or CMD, circuit mode data, and the interfaces to the wayside equipment and for the onboard interfaces. Wayside, it's basically uh, ethernet interface, IP data interfaces, and then onboard, it can be ethernet uh, or, or serial data, depending on the type of equipment connection that is required. Uh, Tetra. Uh, it is a narrow band radio communications standard, uh, but it is very suitable for um, data transmission you know, up to a, a certain limit. Uh, the mod, uh, data wise, the modulation rate over the air is 36 kilobits per second. Uh, but what is actually usable by, uh, by the user uh, himself is uh, 28.8 kilobits uh, per second. And that's uh, divided into four uh, time slots. Tetra is a TDMA time division multiple access system, uh, 25 kilohertz uh, radio channel divided into four time slots and each time slot provides 7.2 kbits uh, per second of, of data throughput. Um, and essentially uh, each time slot can be thought of as a separate radio channel. So you're, you're actually getting four logical radio channels within a single uh, RF channel. Uh, which again, it's uh, speaking as far as efficiency and cost savings, 
um, you know, you're getting, you're basically getting four radio channels for the, the, the price of the hardware of one of a single channel. And then I mentioned that uh, the data services include um, short data service, SDS, if it's a short amount of data to be transmitted, but if it's a longer, if you require a, a greater, longer data messages, meta, data streams, then um, such as for circuit mode data or for IP packet data, then that type of data communication would be assigned a specific dedicated data channel for that type of communication. The, um, the short data service and the status messaging that actually takes place over the, uh, the control channel of the network. Um, again, uh, SDS and status messaging um, up to 140 bytes. So that's you know, basically the same size as a, as a tweet or as a, a text message on your cell phone. Uh, same, same format as well. Uh, um, whereas, as I said, the circuit mode data and packet data modes require, uh, cannot go over the, the short uh, data service. It requires uh, assignment of a dedicated traffic channel. Circuit mode data is basically just data streaming with no, you know, no real control uh, on the input and output or monitoring the data as far as the radio network is, is concerned. The, the, the control of the data that is being transmitted and, and the security and operation of, of that data is a function of the, of the end application. Uh, it's, it's transparent as far as the radio network is, is concerned. Um, circuit mode data basically is just a, a data pipeline and you're able to send and receive you know, whatever you want to uh, over that pipeline uh, as far as the radio network is, is concerned. It's, it's just tra a transparent data stream. Packet data, on the other hand, uh, does uh, include uh, packet uh, headers for, for addressing uh, and defining the type of uh, packet uh, that is being transmitted, and also includes uh, checksums um, in order uh, as, an, as an error prevention or error detection uh, method. So in the case that there is uh, some type of error in transmitting, uh, packet data packets, the, the system will recognize the error that there's a, a problem with the checksum or other type of problem, and then it will automatically uh, retransmit that information um, instantaneously. instantaneously. So um, the transmission of the data is more controlled and more secure, and, and no data is lost in the transmission. I say the ticket beta packet data service includes error detection and a resending mechanism in case of any bad packets. Um, and if the Tetra terminal is involved in the transmission or reception of any IP uh, data uh, while moving along a track, while changing from one cell zone to another cell, um, the data stream, the data connectivity is maintained. There's no loss of data communication when moving out of one uh, covered cell into another covered cell. Now, of course, our equipment supports that. This is, a, a, again, just a general diagram of how it all links together across the different interfaces, either with a Ethernet connection or a serial connection to the, to the onboard equipment. And then, and then I say the uh, as I said, the circuit mode data service um, it enables an external application, in this case the zone controllers, to establish a data oriented connection uh, with the onboard uh, computer and exchange data in both directions. Uh, this diagram here uh, shows how the architecture of how uh, the ETS uh, system uh, in Europe is applied using, using Tetra. We have some actual applications with, with this. Um, it's very similar to the operation of uh, GSMR, uh, which actually is up to now has been the preferred technology for ETS, uh, ETCS projects in Europe. Um, the basic reason why GSMR was selected rather than Tetra was because when that decision was made oh, over 20 years ago, Tetra was a, a relatively new uh, technology, uh, 
you know, in, in examining the Tetra standard and comparing it side by side with the GSMR standard, it was very similar. It complied technically on paper, but it, Tetra had not yet uh, achieved a, a customer base or or been in the market long enough to to uh, inspire uh, confidence in in selecting Tetra for for railway communication and signal use, whereas GSMR had already been around for several years, about 10 years longer than, than Tetra had been. Today, however, there are actually some customers though who are now um, changing from GSMR to Tetra, um, especially outside of, of Europe where GSMR is not necessarily the, the, the technology of choice. Um, and then there, there's one reference, not, not one of our company's reference, but one of our competitors uh, in, in Finland for example, where they have uh, discarded the use of GSMR for their railway signaling and they are using Tetra technology for this. Um, and then, as I say, as far as performance and quality of service is concerned, um, the service and performance offered by Tetra circuit mode data service is effectively equivalent to, to GSMR. Communication interfaces, these uh, are the protocols and the APIs that are available for interfacing our Tetra network to the, to the data application, the railway signaling application. You have dispatcher services for communic voice communication, but then you also have data interfaces for circuit mode data, packet data, um, and, uh, and short data operation. Um, Yeah, that, now there's two types, as I say, two types of data services in Tetra, the packet data. This is a standard IP connection. So if you're familiar with uh, IP and internet protocol and Ethernet protocol, it's exactly the same, very easily understandable. And then in the, the circuit mode data service, you actually have two different protocols involved. The first is a text-based protocol called TDP, the Tetra dispatch protocol used to control the services, for example, to establish and uh, release uh, the data calls. And then there's also a voice over IP protocol uh, for uh, the, uh, the payload frames. Um, and this can be used for primarily for voice calls. In, in railway applications, voice is often the, the exception rather than the norm. Voice is only used on, in special situations or, or sometimes you know even the driver of the vehicle itself doesn't even have permission to start a call rather they have to request permission to use voice and then it is the dispatch operator that then grants them um, permission or opens up the audio their audio accessories so that they are able to make a, a voice call it's usually not something that necessarily the the, um, the vehicle driver himself is allowed to even to even set up as opposed to data, which is functioning uh, functioning 100% of the time on board a train, uh, exchanging information from the rail vehicle and the and the wayside equipment. Uh, the Tetra PEI, I just mentioned that here. It's the PEI stands for Peripheral Equipment Interface. It is a standard uh, hardware interface that is defined in the Tetra standard itself based on AT commands. Um, And then if you look, if you compare the, uh, the Tetra PEI commands with the uh, GSMR AT commands, you see they're, they're basically essentially the same. There's only, I see here in this table, I see really only two or maybe three minor variations between the GSMR command set and the Tetra command set. So um, making the, uh, the, the adapting, um, Adapting Tetra to a rail signaling application, which is already prepared to use GSMR, is really just a, a minor, a minor tweak. It's really not uh, any significant amount of work at all. So, as far as the the viability of using Tetra for rail signaling, uh, it can be uh, proven through a series of, or has been proven through a series of laboratory tests, as well as real world. Uh, actual real world implementations. Uh, but as far as the, the testing is concerned, we're looking at uh, several parameters. 
uh, you know, about a dozen or so different parameters that can be defined for, for a, a rail signaling project about what do you need to look at, what do you need to adapt for to integrate Tetra to the, to the, to, to the signaling app. Um, the testing then, it concerns um, the exchange of idle data between the onboard part of the train uh, with the uh, fixed part of the network and maintaining continuous communication 100% 100 of the time. Uh, compliance with the quality of service requirements for the system and, uh, and ensuring the, uh, or uh, testing and assuring the viability for use in high-speed environments. So about how, how we do we go about with this. Um, yes, now the, the exchange of the vital data, as I said, that has to be continuous and maintain 100% of the time. Um, if, if, the, if the signaling application fails, if there's no uh, communications pipeline available for the railway signaling application, basically the system comes to a halt. You know, the vehicle has to stop. So um, that's not, of course, uh, uh, desirable. So, so the data link needs to be maintained between the train, through the tetra network, to the wayside equipment 100% uh, of the time. Uh, we recommend using one dedicated one dedicated data channel uh, per train. In this case, that would be one single that would be a single Tetra time slot for each train that is expected to be uh, handled or managed within a cell. So, if you you know if you expect to have uh, twenty or forty trains operating within a cell uh, simultaneously, you would need to anticipate uh, most likely one dedicated data slot, data channel for that uh, degree of operation, for that volume of operation. Um, uh, also, as far as um, assuring communication, assuring uh, the reliability of the communication system, we would do um, uh, simulation of the, of the radio, the RF propagation. Uh, in this case, we, we, we would use as the model uh, an environment known as HT200, which means hilly terrain environment with train traveling at 200 kilometers per hour, which is very typical, very typical for European train operations. Uh, assuring communication then even at uh, critical points when the train uh, changes covered cells, from changing from, as you see here, from one uh, base station site to another base station site. And we, uh, and for, uh, for discussing these parameters and these tests, I am, um, basing this on uh, adapting Tetra for the ETCS system. Uh, the, the parameters you see here would be similar, not necessarily exactly the same parameters that you would have for other types of PT, PTC systems, but um, you can see at least though how, um, how Tetra performs for ETCS and then see the differences where uh, it might be necessary to adjust for other types of systems. Uh, yeah, here we have the, the typical uh, QoS requirements for the GSMR system in the uh, ERTMS system. Uh, according to the uh, IRENE specifications, the IRENE stands for European Integrated Railway Radio uh, Network, Enhanced Network. And I'll go through quickly how each of these QoS parameters is, is tested and what are the results that are obtained when uh, when utilizing the Tetra equipment. Uh, first of all, the data transmission. As we said, this has to be continuous uh, and dedicated, a dedicated uh, link between the train to the, way, to the wayside equipment. As I mentioned earlier, Tetra offers a 7.2 kilobits per slot and can operate in two modes, uh, circuit data mode, and we're going to focus on that because that is what uh, ETCS currently utilizes. Although I will mention uh, PDP, the packet data mode, because there are other systems that prefer packet data rather than circuit data. And there also uh, are presently uh, ongoing discussions of ETS eventually migrating to IP packet data. So the concentration is on circuit mode, but packet data is uh, of interest for certain other applications and also for the future of uh, ETCS. Connection establishment, uh, delay shall be uh, less than eight and a half seconds, 95% of the time, and less than 10 seconds, 100% of the times. Uh, the response with Tetra is fully compliant. In fact, it's faster 
than what is uh, demanded by the requirement, faster than GSMR. Transfer delay is the, the value of the elapsed time between a request for transfer of a data block and the indication that the uh, transfer was uh, successful. Uh, we're talking about then transmitting as a requirement 30 bytes of data uh, within half a second, 99% of the time. Again, through Tetra circuit mode data, fully comply. Uh, in packet data mode, the packet sizes are greater than 30 bytes. So you're, you're actually talking about more data than just 30 bytes. So it, the time required to do that is a bit longer, but still does not exceed one and a half seconds. BER, the bit error rate and the packet loss rate. Uh, bit error rate of GSMR is 0.01% uh, and exactly the same measurement in Tetra circuit mode data as well. Uh, in PDP, in packet mode data, the criteria is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, packet loss, which is less than 1%. Transmission interference period and error-free period. Um, again, you have time limits here defined for a GSMR and uh, using what is called the type one handover in Tetra, it, uh, it fully complies. The difference between type one handover and type three handover that you see here, um, type one handover is a, a smooth transition from one communication cell to another cell. Uh, there is no loss of communication. Um, the, the system anticipates that it's about to change into another cell and it, it registers onto the next cell even before it actually arrives. A type three handover, however, it makes a cut. It, when it leaves, say you're in cell A and you want to go to cell B, well, at the border between those cells, it will actually cut the data communication and then re-register in the next cell. Uh, of course, in a railway signaling application, you don't want that to happen. You prefer to have the smooth uh, transition from one cell to another. And as I, again, as I pointed out, the circuit mode data uh, complies 100% with that. Registration delays with the network. Again, um, this is a, a network parameter. So depending on effective and efficient design of the radio network, it's very, very easy to meet these, these requirements. In fact, uh, registering with the network with Tetra is requires only about half the time as with the GSMR. So again, fully complied with that one. Encryption, there is no encryption requirement for uh, ETCS or GSMR. Tetra, however, does offer the option uh, for over-the-air encryption of the, of the voice and data communication if that is desired. Certain project-specific issues, coverage and network load. Again, it depends on what your network is, where it is, how many vehicles, how much traffic. Uh, that's a, a design issue that is discussed between, uh, between ourselves. Uh, and the signaling uh, provider and the and the end customer. Capacity, again, the X number of trains within a, a, a certain area. Um, the network is dimensioned uh, according to the needs. Uh, again, basically, as I said, we recommend on the average one data channel, one data time slot for each train that's going to be operating in this in that cell uh, simultaneously. No single port on failure, high availability. Again, Tetra is a mission critical uh, public safety grade ready communications network. And we can provide you, you know, the five nines reliability that you need and availability that you need for, for this. Speed data communication up to 200 kilometers. Theoretically, Tetra will actually perform much, uh, much faster than that, uh, up to you know, over 1,000 kilometers per hour the theoretically. Uh, in actual tests, uh, it's been tested up to, with, with Alstom, uh, testing Tetra up to 560 kilometers per hour. Uh, as far as actual real world use though, I mean, this is just a test, but it's pretty fast. 560 kilometers per hour in a test uh, of the technology. But as far as real world use on an actual uh, rail line, um, it usually, is around 200 kilometers. In some cases, it can be up to 300 or even 350. But of course, the the, the theoretical theoretical and tested um, capacity of Tetra is, is much higher. 
and moving right on in then to the viability for uh, for high speed. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, maximum speed performed by uh, supported by e, uh, ETCS is 350 kilometers per hour, and Tetra is is demonstrated to be able to comply with that. Uh, these next few slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about packet mode data, uh, and the reason being that ETCS is uh, intending to migrate eventually to packet switching mode uh, over circuit circuit data mode, and in this case. Um, for simulation for integration, we're assuming 400 kilometers per hour. So that's you know that's really twice the velocity that that's probably going to be actually demanded. Um, propagation model again: hilly terrain, uh, high-speed train through tunnels with leaky feeder cable. Uh, and uh, what are the effects? What what? How does the the Doppler effect affect communications at, at high speeds? Looking at the dynamic sensitivity of the radio equipment, the Doppler effect, uh, speed effect and cell reselection, and the end-to-end -end, uh, QoS measurements. Uh, dynamic sensitivity, again, um, Tetra fully complies in all three propagation models, um, moving at uh, 70 kilometers per hour, 200 kilometers per hour, and 400 kilometers per hour, um, with no effect, no adverse effect in the dynamic sensitivity. In fact, in fact, it seems to get better at higher speeds. Uh, the same with uh, packet data. The Doppler effect has no significant adverse effect on the use of packet data over Tetra, uh, including through tunnels. And in fact, in use in the 800 megahertz band, you have a theoretical speed limit of 620 kilometers per hour. Of course, there are no present plans to go that fast, but the technology has been demonstrated to support uh, that capacity. Speed effect and cell uh, reselection. Um, again, there is a cell reselection protocol or adjustment tool um, that allows uh, estimating the losses when, when changing from one cell to another. But then I also mentioned that uh, when changing cells, the system anticipates that it's going to change your cells. So it establishes communication with the next cell actually even before it actually arrives there and does the handover. And then the QoS measurements. Basically, I've discussed this already. Here you see a table with the actual parameters. We can make copies of this presentation available upon request. Um, yeah, so just summarizing, you know, compliant, compliance with all with all requirements, uh, the delay requirements, the QoS requirements, Tetra uh, performs better than uh, better than requested, outperforming the GSMR system in, in all aspects. Um, just going to quickly, just a few train control references that we have uh, from our company, from Powertron. Unfortunately, none of these are high speed lines, but they are ETCS and other PTC uh, type systems. Uh, the first one is in uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan Railways. We have two lines that we're operating uh, there with our system, uh, one line of 150 kilometers and another one of 300 kilometers. Uh, we're providing complete turnkey system, complete Tetra network infrastructure, uh, and the onboard uh, equipment. And the Kazakhstan Railways reference was, in fact, it was the first example worldwide of ETCS being run over over Tetra uh, technology. So we were. You know, we had the first successful case in demonstrating this this possibility, and it's it's since been duplicated in other parts of the world as well. Uh, Finoco Northern Railways in Colombia. This is for uh, an automatic uh, automated uh, mining train, 250 kilometer track length. Um, again, complete Tetra network infrastructure, onboard units, uh, and uh, our Sokoko dispatch system application, and the integration. The railway signaling uh, application we've integrated with in this case was actually uh, provided by a General Electric, uh, G, uh, General Electric Transportation System. And then we have also have another reference in Mozambique. Again, it's a mining train uh, over 900 miles, uh, sorry, over 900 kilometers of track length. Uh, it turned the system again 
in this case, the radio signaling application the provider was uh, Siemens. So we're working with, uh, with Siemens, with uh, uh, Alstom, uh, Bombardier and GE, although those all have now been acquired by Alstom, but we are working with all major manufacturers around the world in integrating uh, our Tetra uh, products with their railway signaling applications. The integration process, very simple. It's really in two steps. Uh, you have uh, a laboratory uh, phase, and then you have a, a real world uh, verification phase. But the, in, for inputs, you have a test plan to guarantee the QAS parameters. Uh, you have a, a series of meetings and consultants, consultancies sessions between power trunk and the, and the end customer and the uh, signaling manufacturer provider. And then that's validated through the use of uh, set, uh, simulators in a, in a laboratory environment. Uh, once everything is okay with that, once you pass all of the laboratory tests, you go to step two, which is the rural integration. In this case, uh, it's the same test plan more or less, but rather than doing it with simulators, you're, you're doing it with actual uh, real world hardware installer, an actual train and actual railway equipment. And then that's run really over a uh, over test track, uh, train manufacturers, and uh, they have their own test tracks uh, when, when developing their, their, new, their new systems. And so this is, this is run over that to verify it's used before putting out into the real world. Here we have an example of our certificate of the ETCS uh, integration with uh, Siemens. And then as far as uh, Tetra and CBTC is mentioned, uh, CBTC really, it's not a standard. So it's all different. You know, you can go to, to New York or to New Jersey or to Kazakhstan or London or wherever, and it's all going to be different. So you have to treat those product uh, projects on a case-by-case -case basis, even though the general concepts still remain the same. And Tetra is, of course, uh, able to be adapted and integrated into, into those types of, of systems. So hopefully I didn't go too long on that. Um, so uh, let me turn it back over to you, Rick, and see if we have any, any questions. Yeah, and uh, if you can unshare your screen. Okay, there we go. Uh, excellent. So um, to kind of step back to the very basics. Uh, so what um, goes by the short, version PTC um, in most railroad applications in the US is actually a system called interoperable electronic train management system. So IETMS, which is similar to the ETCS uh, mm -hmm. application in Europe. Where exactly would in the process would the, um, the Tetra radios fit in IETMS? Um, okay. In, in two ways, actually. You have the onboard equipment and then you have the, the radio network equipment. The, the radio network would run along a track slide and, and would be interfaced to the wayside equipment. Um, and, then, and then taking that then back to the, the uh, the operational control center. Uh, on board the train, you have the Tetra radio devices. You'd probably have uh, uh, two separate radios, one for voice, if it's required. If the voice is not required, you just have uh, then just the data portion. Uh, and then that would be connected either by serial or ethernet uh, interface to the onboard computer, uh, which is, which is um, handling the, uh, the communication with the railway signaling application. And the Tetra radio is really essentially just a, a, a data modem uh, over the air, you know, over, over, the, over the airwaves. Um, it's exactly the same as GSMR as far as operation, just instead of using the GSMR equipment and the GSMR frequency band, we would use the, the Tetra uh, equipment and the Tetra frequency bands. Uh, and Tetra being uh, a bit more modern technology than GSMR. Uh, provides greater output power, provides greater um, geographic coverage, longer range, uh, and so therefore requires less of an, less of a, an investment 
um, because you don't require as many cells with Tetra as you would require with GSMR. So it's the same basic principle, but it's a, 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 a different technology, but providing the, the exact same service. So part of the challenge in adopting this in the States is that any locomotive that goes on that section of railroad would have to have these radios as opposed to what they're using today. Yes, that's, that's true. So it, it, it's all in part of the planning process of the lines that you're gonna be operating on. I mean, what, you know, what, what equipment, what protocols do I need to be able to support in order to, to traverse this, this line? So yeah, so if you're going to have if you're going to have trains uh, coming onto or going off into other types of systems, they need to be equipped to to operate with whatever uh, system is 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 being used on that particular uh, length of track. Okay, and so currently those uh, Wabtec is providing those radios, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think so. Okay. Um, so I think so. Fred has a question that I think um is answered here but um so how would this work in an environment where amtrak commuter trains and freight trains are all operating on the same track at the same time um okay again that that depends on which particular radio signaling application you are you're using uh the tetra network as i say is basically the pipeline in order for the um, the data to be to be sent and and received. Uh, the Tetra system is not the signaling application it, itself. Okay, so I think the answer is all of the locomotives have to have that type of radio. Yes. Off. Yeah. If they're if... okay. Um, a a question that I think isn't relevant, uh, but uh, Ted is asking: Is blockchain a development environment that we might be used in the railroad environment? Um, and blockchain is not about communication, it's about recording transactions, right? So it's not really relevant to this. Discussion. I don't think that's relevant to, to communications and signaling. It, it, blockchain might have some type of um, application to what I mentioned before about non-mission critical data applications that are on a train, you know, maybe maybe services that are being provided to the, to the passengers or something like that. But as far as the communication and signaling for the actual uh, operation of, of the service i as far as i would not i don't see in, anything that bitching would apply to there okay and then i um and then roger had asked about encryption um so i i think you answered his question but just to make sure he's asking if if it can be encrypted from end to end yes it can be it can be encrypted um ETCS does not require encryption, but Tetra, the Tetra radio technology supports encryption. Um, most particularly what we call the Tetra air interface encryption. Uh, and what that does, it provides a, a, a basic encryption of everything that's transmitted over the air between the onboard radio and the radio base station at, at the wayside. Okay. I, you know, um... Uh, rail fans use the communications between the dispatcher and the engineer to track trains. And if you encrypted that, what would they do? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, how, uh, kind of a, just a generic question, but in high speed, um, there are cases in, let's call it bumpy territory, where you might go a uh, tunnel, bridge over a valley, tunnel, bridge over a valley, a little bit of flat, tunnel, bridge over a valley, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, how do you maintain radio communications at high speeds with, when you're going through those various things? Well, it, it depends on your cell size. Uh, as I say, the a Tetra cell is larger than a, than a GSMR cell. So you get longer coverage range. Um, but then going through, say, tunnels, for example, you would have... Uh, um, a leaky feeder cable covering that tunnel. And then of course there's signal being injected uh, out, outside the tunnel, being injected into the tunnel to assure the coverage. And then it's also possible to, um, you know, if you say like in really hilly or mountainous, or mountainous type 
um, uh, terrain, you can have smaller, shorter range uh, local fill-in repeaters uh, as well uh, to provide, like I say, fill-in coverage to those where, where it might be a little bit spotty. Okay. And then the leaky, leaky cable, if I'm right, um, looking at high-speed railroads in Spain, they have a cable down the middle of the ties that's sitting on top of the ties. And my assumption has always been that's where the radio signal is coming from. Um, is, that, is that what you're referring to? In the, so the, the cable goes the entire length of the railroad. And so my assumption is that then the, the train has total communications because that cable is always there. Um, well, I think uh, the case, the case uh, in that case in particular, the, the cable um, may not be a radio cable, maybe a fiber optic cable, uh, because you have different uh, beacons or balises installed along the length of the, the train, and then as the train passes over that beacon, then there is a, a, an RF, a radio frequency transfer of data from the train to the to a small transceiver located there at the track, but then that small transceiver is linked then into that fiber optic cable. So I oh, don't, okay. that, 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 so that cable going down the track, I don't think it's an RF cable. I think it's, uh, I think it's fiber optic. Okay, okay. Yeah, but, but, the way, but the way that the information is transferred from the train uh, to the fiber optic is through a radio communication to a small transceiver that is tied into the fiber optic every certain distance or wherever needed. Okay, okay. Because um, I know in the US, uh, uh, some cab signaling systems have the, actually the signals in the rail and there's a little transceiver that's resting on the locomotive. It's just above yeah, the exactly. rail. That's, exactly. that's the same concept as a leaky cable. Yes. Right? Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, to clarify Ted's question, so Tetra's uh, Tetra is the process communication rather than being about the data itself. It's it's simply the, the radios. Yeah, Tetra is the radio technology, and the Tetra onboard devices are basically asked, adding, acting as data modems, and they're they're the pipeline for the data that needs to be exchanged for for the railway signaling application. Okay. Tetra Tetra is not Tetra is not the signaling application. It's the technology that supports the communication for the for the application. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming. I, I don't see any more questions. Is there anybody that's got a dying question out there that hasn't been answered? No? Okay. Thank you again for coming. I really appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Um, and uh, look forward to talking again. And for those who joined us, if you liked this presentation, please go to highspeedrail.us. Um, and make a donation so that we can continue to do more of these. Um, thanks again to everybody for coming, and we will talk again soon.